All right, then we can go ahead and open up the uh, Northampton Planning Board's meeting of Thursday, February 10th. Um, what we traditionally do is ask if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to make a public comment not related to tonight's agenda. And tonight's agenda is basically to look at an ordinance, um, an ordinance having to do with uh, to allow beverage service and entertainment at farm stands. So if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to another topic, please raise your hand. I don't see okay. any. Great. Well, then let's open up this uh, public hearing. For, it's actually a continuation of a public hearing on zoning amendment relative to beverage service and entertainment at farm stands. This was continued from November 18th, 2021. We continued it so that we could get some more information from the Agricultural Commission and the Licensing Commission before we kind of uh, discuss this too much. And since then, Carolyn has brought us back some notes from those, both of those commissions, um, which she sent to us by email. Hopefully everybody got a chance to look at those little summaries. All right, um, Carolyn, you wanna walk us through the proposed changes to the ordinance? Sure, I'm just gonna pull it up on the screen. Um, so if you um, um, get it situated here, um, the, this goes back to, um, I guess, November. Um, and I'm going to do a sh screen share. Um, so as you had mentioned, there were some questions that you all had um, about, um, you know, what this means for, oops, did I bring the right one up? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, you know, whether, what exactly the permitting path would be um, for, um, for people, what the Ag Commission might have to say about it. And so as, um, as I mentioned in my email, I was able to go to an Ag, Ag Commission meeting and had you know good conversation with them. Um, they definitely, gosh, I'm having a problem here trying to get the review track changes so it shows all of that. So there we go. Um, so um, you know, one thing that, as I mentioned in my email. Um, I've got, and what's on the screen are um, the, high, the highlighted in yellow are changes based on um, some of the feedback from both the Ag Commission and also the conversation I had with the um, council clerk or the um, license clerk in the mayor's office. Um, and that's uh, based on sort of questions that came also arose out of your meeting back in November about this issue. So. Starting at the top, you know, you had a question about why this um, ordinance wouldn't be effective in the Special Conservancy District, which is the primarily the meadows of the Connecticut River. Um, so everything sort of east of Bridge Street um, and that whole and where the fairgrounds are and the airport is located, all those fields are Special Conservancy, and um, the. Ag Commission felt similarly that it didn't seem to make sense to exclude um, farmers who are in those districts because there are other regulations that would come into play if, for example, they needed to build structures or um, improve the property in some other way to accommodate such events. So. Um, they felt that it, it would be appropriate to also include the special conservancy district. So that's why I've got this highlighted here as a change from the original ordinance that's been introduced um, to city council and the one um, which was part of your discussion back in November. Um, so the idea is to allow, again, sort of agritourism or some other opportunities for um, 
farmers to um, sort of add on to their um, existing um, product that is, they're growing um, on their um, property. And um, this also went through the city solicitor. So some of these um, changes are um, addressed some of his follow-up comments, but the next line says the use described above includes following only when licensed by the license commission or with the mayor's license. And I'll go in and describe that. Um, one service of alcohol beverages produced on site, um, alcoholic beverages, sorry, that wasn't, that's just a clarifying term to, to um, make it clear that it's really the, serv the service of alcohol, which is what got us to this place in the first place, because there were some, there's um, farms around the Commonwealth that are getting these farmer brewer licenses from the licensing commission. But, um, and that's specifically because they're alcoholic beverages. Um, and then accessory events and entertainment unrelated to on-site production, not to exceed 20 such events per year. Originally it was four. Again, 20 is sort of an arbitrary number, but the Agricultural Commission felt like that was, um, they didn't land on 20. They felt like four was um, not enough, but they also are concerned and would uh, essentially sort of monitor, would like to monitor the situation. It, it seemed to me, that was my interpretation, um, to make sure that this doesn't become the tail that wags the dog um, and that the primary function continues to be the agricultural production on the property and not you know, the wedding events or the other kinds of events that might happen. Chris has his hand up. Um, George, if you wanna, okay. He's muted. Chris, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just curious, is the, is the zoning code where we would wanna enforce the number of events or is, you know, would the licensing bodies be the ones who would be the enforcement mechanism? So uh, that's a really good question. I mean, that's sort of, there's always been this um, division about land use versus, you know, other jurisdictions that other committees or the commission in particular in this case would have. The zoning can't tell the license, uh, the license commission has a very defined jurisdiction and they, um, it's different from a land use piece. So the reason why I'm suggesting that there are limits is because there are land use implications. And so it makes sense to have that piece of zoning. Um, and as I mentioned in my email, the license commission has allowed 24 seven, all hours of the day, almost um, functionality of, of this one particular place on um, Sylvester Road. So their focus is more, um, you know, they're looking at noise, they're looking at, they're not necessarily thinking about it in a land use um, pers perspective per se, except if it has an impact on, you know, neighbors relative to noise, um, or if they violate, or if they're not carting some, you know, people at the, at the event or something like that. Yeah, do you have another question about that? Well, I, I, I guess I don't understand how, the zoning code would enforce, you know, if they have 21 events, like what happens? There's, there's no, there's no zoning code officer who's, who's walking around the, the farm fields enforcing this. So I think the only way it would ever come up is if there are noise complaints or if it gets too crowded or something, in which case it would go to the licensing committees and they would modify or revoke the license. So that's the way it is for any zoning regulation that you ever read <laughs> or evaluate. It's always the zoning code enforcement officer who is the building commissioner. And in, as in any other of these codes, it really is um, a complaint driven system. So if a neighbor wants to call and complain, they pick up the phone and they can call the building commissioner and the commissioner can say, give me show me your receipts, show me proof that you're not having more than 20 per year. And then if there is a violation, then 
there are steps and procedures that the building commissioner can take to enforce the zoning. But it's it's the same with any zoning ordinance. Every every bit of the zoning code is enforced that way. Um, and I and I would say that um, there is a difference. You know, the license commission doesn't care about traffic. The license commission doesn't care about landscaping on the property. Doesn't care about other mitigating. Not that they don't care. That's not the right word. That's not their jurisdiction. Whereas the under zoning and the planning board, if a property, in this case, this would be a by right use, but if one that requires um, site plan review comes in, the planning board has the ability to look at a proposal and, and request that additional mitigating measures be implemented to address potential concerns. And so that's why it's important to sort of think about it from a zoning code perspective, which is a different lens um, than what the licensing commission is is um, using. So if they want to have 21 to 60 events per year, they have to come to site plan review, right? Correct. So what would the planning board be looking for in a site plan review of a place that was having 21 events versus 20 events? Like what's the difference in a site plan that we would be looking for? Well, I mean, it's an arbitrary threshold, but basically you're saying, okay, with 21 events, we want to know, you know, what days of the week, what the hours are, are there conflicts with, um, you know, other peak traffic things that are happening during that time? Do you have that, enough parking? Where's your parking? Do you need stormwater for the parking? You know, if you're creating- But isn't that, parking, that's not a frequency thing. You could have one event a year with 5,000 people. That's a parking issue. It's not a frequency problem. Well, it could be a frequency problem if you're having 500 events a year instead of 20, um, and you know it then becomes could potentially become disruptive with other thing, other um, activities that are typically going on in that in that surrounding neighborhood or that district on those overlapping times. Um, so. The difference between 20 and 21, you know, I couldn't tell you what that is, but at some point you would need to draw the line. I mean, every one of these. Well, uh, I mean, I said 20, say 20 to 60. I mean, I just, yeah. I'm not quite sure what I would be looking for in a site plan review. Anything you need for one event, you need for many events, right? I, I, I mean, I don't really get it. Um, it's really about the how many times per year is this one spot being affected and are there other things that can be addressed in that so if you're bringing 100 people in 60 times a year, you know, depending on the days of the week, it might have um, a much different impact than if it's just 20 because it's, it's more sporadic, it's spread out through the through the year. Um, so, um, you know, you also, there might be some compression. So let's say you had um, hay rides in October or September and October. It's just gonna, maybe it's 20 times for those um, compressed months, or maybe it's, you know, you have hay rides in one part of the season and something else in another part of the season. Um, it's hard to know exactly what it would be, but I think it's really about the total annual, I guess, impact that it has in the neighborhood and if there are ways to address those. Through farms not by right. Board jurisdiction. Can farms not have hay rides currently? Um, <laughs> well, that gets to the, that gets to the point of mayoral license. Um, so, Yes, a farm could have a hayride. And if you charge for this thing, then you get a license from the mayor if you're not serving alcohol. Um, uh, but, that's my kind of hayride, wow. <laughs> without alcohol. But no, but it's a, it's, a, it's a zoning violation right now to have a, a hayride? Like no, this is allowing I mean, it? Yeah. I would say, I would say you could call this probably, we would probably evaluate it as accessory to growing pumpkins, let's say, or whatever you're growing, hay 
and you're growing hay. And yes, probably we'd say it's accessory to that. I'm trying to think of events that might, you know, draw people. So maybe, maybe the hayride isn't a good example. Maybe it's more like a haunted house event that's on top of the hayride. I wouldn't say a haunted house is related to growing hay or pumpkins, but let's say they wanted to add that on to the hayride. They'd probably need a mayoral license if they weren't selling alcohol. And then if they were, they'd get a license, they'd get a license from the license commission. Um, but, Carolyn, but I wouldn't so say a haunted none, house is allowed now. So none of these licenses, either from the license commission or the, the, mayor, the mayor's office deal at all with you know, traffic or parking or on-site restroom facilities or anything for these areas where there aren't you know, structures built specifically for the purpose? Um, I can't say, I don't, I, um, I think they do look at some of those and there's a, there's sort of their health issues. So you have to have a certain amount of, uh, I believe you need to have, you know, porta potties if at some threshold. So yes, they would also make sure that they're, you know, especially if there's food service that then they need some other permit from health, but it's not really, um, it's not, it's more about, um, you know, the fee collection, I think, and making sure that, you know, there's food and health, um, you know, um, accommodations at the site. It's not really I, about I how agree. many people are coming. I agree with David. I don't see how one event is different than 20 events is different than 60 events in that you need to provide, think about the facilities to have those events. So if you're having you know, 500 people in a farm field once or, or every weekend, it's, you kind of still need those facilities for that event. So I just, that's where I'm getting hung up is like putting a number on it. Yeah. Well, let me, let me give you an example that's, that's, um, is sort of analogous, um, where I think a number does make sense. So to, to have a threshold. So if you had a one-off event and you had 500 people show up for whatever function you are having. That's pretty much anyone can say, okay, that was a one-off thing. We don't care about that. It's, it's fine. They're trying to raise money for their farm. But if, for example, you every weekend, three or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you had the same 500 people coming every day and the thing that comes to mind is when soccer used to be a thing down at the Oxbow. And every time they added more and more days to the week of those events, you know, they'd have tournaments, they'd have all day practices on the weekend. It became more and more problematic um, with traffic and neighborhood impact. I don't know what that number is, but I think there's some, there's a logic in creating a threshold for these numbers are so minor, they're so incidental and accessory that it probably doesn't rise to the level of needing additional review. And then at some point, and again, the number is probably, is, is gonna be arbitrary at some point. I don't know what the number is, but at some point, I think it probably makes, um, it makes a difference and the, maybe some additional analysis and review could, um, is appropriate and the board can look at the specific site, you know, what, you know, how many of, how many of such things might create an impact or how many people are coming and so forth. And that's just not, you know, um, the, the things that the planning board would look at are, are going to be slightly different than what the mayor's office is. Um, I'm thinking a, a couple of comments. <clears throat> One, we don't have any examples of this yet. And I would hope that when some of these farms start thinking of going into events like this, that they talk to their abutters and their neighbors. That may or may not happen. Um, but then the neighbors certainly will let the building inspector know if it gets out of control. They can look at this piece of paper and say, well, I'm within my right. I have these 20 things. It doesn't matter whether I have a um, port potties or not. That's all up to my customers. 
big business people, I think they're going to plan for those 500 people and do the best they can to make sure they have a good experience so they come back. And in terms of the special permit, um, it, because there's not any need to really tell your neighbors what's going on, at least having a special permit, then the applicant needs to inform everybody within that radius of the special permit hearing and this is what we'll be doing and so it gives us it gives that neighborhood a chance to kind of weigh in on things that they may not have had before um yeah it's a, you know i think this is going to be interesting as we open up this avenue for people which we really want to do to give them some flexibility to sell products and to use their farm in other ways that you know make sense to them and make sense to the public in case we, we do have one example, which is what brought this um, to the surface, is the um, Mineral Hills Winery on Sylvester Road. And that's the example I said the License Commission has, you know, seven years ago gave them sort of wide open uh, um, permitting. And there hasn't, they haven't had to call them back because of the issues there. Um, they have seen this draft, they were fine with it. Um, and um, so I think you're right there. But again, it sort of it does go back to um, this also allows sort of a little bit of a trial period um, of by, you know, allowing farmers to engage in other activities. Um, and not and and if there is a problem, then that will surface and could be addressed if they wanted to um, go beyond that number and through site plan, or even it, it would also be raised to the level of um, where the licensing commission, if they had granted the original license, could call them back in for a hearing to discuss sort of particulars about it. So is Mineral Hills winery being open for people to come taste on a weekend day. Is that considered an event? No, no. That's just being that's, open. That's just being open because you're you're buying product. They're allowed to sell their product there. Okay. It's they've been hosting weddings and um, music events. And that's where that would fall into this category. How about trucks too, I think. What then? Have they had food trucks as well there? I'm not sure. Uh, it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Somewhat analogous to this is about 15 years ago, the city was having a problem with uh, so many tag sales that many streets were just overrun with every weekend. There was a tag sale and a lot of neighbors started <laughs> Yeah. having some issues with that so finally i think there was and i'm not sure where this came out of it wasn't a zoning ordinance maybe it was a building inspector but they there was a limit to how many tag sales you could have are you serious oh my god it was <laughs> well david if your neighbor <laughs> packed up their driveway every weekend and you had 20 30 yeah 40 that apartment cars, on uh by the jacks on jackson street that's out there every weekend or is it not now? Is it because of that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it gave butters, it gave neighbors a little opportunity to, to kind huh. of address that if it was overdone. My neighbor rakes too much in the fall. I don't like that. <laughs> I, I, I I don't know. I, I, I think this is, I would just let it be like, let people figure it out. Because I mean, it seems like, like we don't know what kind of trucks Mineral Hills Winery has, right? There's no zoning police, right? So you're only going to find out about it. So the people who have more neighbors who are around them will get complaints. And the people who don't have neighbors won't get complaints and they'll do whatever they want. They can collect. I mean, I guess that's fine. <laughs> I guess my point is the Mineral Hills people haven't had any complaints. If they had, the licensing commission could go back and put different restrictions on them. Right. So why limit them to 20, right? Well, yeah, so what does that have to do with us? Um, well, first of all, the, their use is not allowed. I mean, you can't, it's just, it's not accessory to growing grapes and producing wine. Serving, um, serving alcohol, you know, at a, at a bar is a bar. 
Um, so at, at the zoning needs to be changed to address it. If you feel that there doesn't need to be a limit because the license commission can, can deal with it or the mayor's licensing can deal with it, that's fine, but it needs to be stated in the zoning at some level. So if you wanna recommend that there's no cap, that it's just allowed, as long as there's a mayoral license or a license commission license, I mean, that could be a way for you to um, move forward. Um, but at this point, whatever Mineral Hills is doing is not allowed. No, I, I completely understand. I understand that the zoning needs to be changed to include that. And I'm, yeah. I'm all for including it. That my only hang up is just on that. that number. And I, I guess I just don't understand how, how the license, I mean, to me, I don't know how you could give a license for an event without kind of planning for traffic control or facilities like would the I that just boggles my mind that that's how it operates. That seems like something that's part of event planning to me. Yeah, I think we'd be doing a better job if we actually were a little bit more clear about what it is that we'd be looking for to hold events like parking or bathrooms or something like that. I don't know what's already covered in other parts of the zoning or the building code, but uh, the, uh, the fact is if we're limiting it and saying by right, you can do a few events and, but you need to go through this process to have a lot of events. You're sort of saying, people who don't really know what they're doing, they can do whatever they want. It's the people who know what they're doing, they have to go through this process. So it's sort of like uh, incentivizing uh, amateurism, I suppose. Um, what I mean, would we be, but I go back to this thing, what are we looking for? If they come to site plan review, I don't understand what the heck we'd be reviewing other than look at my place, I don't know. We would know where the parties are. I mean, that's important. <laughs> I have kids, I don't care. <laughs> so though the things that you look at in site plan I, I mean the biggest issue I think is going to be traffic volume and if so if you're doing 50 events a year um that potentially and depending on the size of it that could have very different implications than but 20 events a year or, 20 events a year is not 20 events like 1.5 a month it's it's two times for 10 weeks in the summer that's what it is so i don't think it's a difference honestly 20 events is every week in the summer no one's going to do events in february <laughs> I mean, that's when it's nice to be on a farm right so I, I again i don't see it as a difference yeah in five I, I, years the they'll be doing it starting in march <laughs> well great <laughs> I, I think the only reason to put a number there is because I, I wouldn't want like a change. Like if, if I have a business and I'm, and I been, and I'm doing everything right, but then somehow, the you know, there's some event that happens and, and leads to the mayor not giving out these, um, these permits. I wouldn't want that to suddenly get in the way of me having my legitimate business. Does that make, does that make sense? I'm, I guess I'm, I think you I, still I, need the mayoral license either way though. Do you? Okay. Well, I don't then. think this replaces that requirement. It just adds a new requirement. Yeah, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm, Karen, so what was their reason for wanting a number? I'm sorry, go back, going back to that. Because it um, seems like we're just hung up on that. And yeah. So originally, the reason was um, sort of thinking about what at what point do the number of events that you're having really take over and, and being the thing that you're having instead of the agricultural component on the property, and um, the first number that was, um, the first number was really based on the four months was based, or the four, number four was based on the fact that in the state statute, agricultural um, sales of product um, um, produced on the site is allowed um, by right for um, 
you know, four months of the year, there's a four month and beyond number. So I just extrapolated that and said, okay, four times, but if there's no magic in that number. And now, I mean, once we took this to, once I had this conversation with the Agricultural Commission, it really became clear to them that they wanted some kind of limit and maybe it's a cap. Maybe it doesn't, maybe there's not an intermediate threshold of site plan, but they wanted to make sure that this, again, doesn't become the function, the function on the property as opposed to the growing of grapes or strawberries or corn or whatever it is, that it's not all these amusements that are happening every day that people are drawn to. It's the, the, and then they lose actually the growing capacity or they quit that because it becomes so lucrative to do this other thing. Um, isn't this more of a tax? Isn't this more of a tax thing? Like, I mean, if if, if someone's if the majority of their income is coming from parties versus gr grape growing, like, isn't this something that can just be reviewed every every year? Well, no. I mean, well, that's you. You might think that, except that it might be really. Um, there might be much more monetary gain from having 10 events in the summer, but you're still growing for eight months in the year. And the growing part is really important. You're still doing that during the day. You're doing that, you yeah. know, for those eight months, whereas the weddings might be just three months, but the tax value from that might be greater. So it's hard in, I think it would be hard to just draw a straight line between, you know, the, um, looking at whether or not something's become accessory um, or, you know, principal, um, so, just using the sales revenue. So we think that above 60 events a year, that's when the events would become so dominant that we think, I mean, roughly that's the idea that above 60 events, then that becomes more important than the actual agricultural use. It could be, I, I mean, I, it's, again, it's an arbitrary number. I don't, there's no science behind saying 60, definitely, because it also depends on what's happening, what the events are, what the underlying grow, you know, um, function is on the property, what they're growing. Um, so there might be other, you know, activities that um, at the property that, um, you know, contribute to that. So I, I, I don't know what that number is. Carolyn, is there not an entity in our government that could just go off of, if they start getting complaints, let's say the guy next to me has a big lot and he's supposed to be growing grapes, but every year he has 75 parties and I'm the nosy neighbor and I'm like, I don't even think the dude grows grapes anymore. Isn't there somebody that that person would call and that person could go out and just assess it and be like, are you growing grapes or aren't you? Or are you just throwing parties? <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, that I kind becomes of a land on the arbitrary yeah. thing too. It's like, okay, ten parties, twenty parties, five parties. I get the general premise. We don't want somebody to be taking advantage of an ag agricultural piece of land and benefiting off of party planning. Like, I totally get that, but it's also we're coming up with some arbitrary number, and for one piece of property five parties might be the threshold, but somebody else's piece of property, they could do 20 a year and they would still have like a booming potato business and we would yeah. be keeping them from doing it. So is there not an entity that could just, I mean, trust me, there's a, a lot of neighbors that love to call the government. So somebody would be a whistleblower. We're not shy that's the, on whistleblowers. That's the building commissioner. So that's someone will call up and He's say- He's gonna love that. Hey, there's, well, he loves it already for all the other things. <laughs> so there's more yeah. people with that guy's speed dial on their cell phones. I'm yeah. sure that if somebody was having too many parties, that they would have yeah. the neighbor that would call the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, maybe just to sort of move this forward, it might make sense to say, okay, the site plan threshold is really throwing you off. Pick a number, you know, is it 60, is it 100? and say beyond that is not allowed. And then it's not as though, you know, we have to start somewhere. If someone comes up and says, I need 101 events. And then another person says, yeah, I need 150. You know, at some point 
the zoning can be changed. You know, it's not going to be set in stone forever. Um, but I, it's important to get something there. And then if it's, if it's the wrong thing, it can be adjusted. I, I feel like measuring the number of events is what's throwing me off. Like, why is that the metric? Why isn't it the density of the event or something like that? Or how many people at the event? Yeah, right. The density. Oh, density of people, people, right, right, right. How many people per acre? Like, I don't, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the code where it's like, oh, this is a threshold for an entertainment use um, that's outside of a building, right? But there must be something we can point to instead of just pulling a, a number out of a hat. Well, I mean, that's not an easy answer either, I guess I would say, because the potato farmer in the meadows has how many acres? Right. <laughs> and exactly. that versus right. this other small farm that wants to have exactly. 20 events. Exactly, they're totally different. And, but if someone, if someone says, if, doesn't, if there's a farmer folks, having- folks, can we start raising our hands a little bit? We're really yeah. starting to talk over each other. Sorry, yeah. Hard, especially for Krista. <clears throat> so, uh, Chris, do you want to finish your thought? <laughs> David, you want to finish your thought? Um, oh, I was just gonna. I was considering what uh, someone was saying about the complaints. I'm just thinking about how we make these kinds of decisions in site plan review. If there's someone who's been having 19 events a year and everyone's been coming and complaining about them, I guess we'd be very, no matter what kind of site plan they showed us, we'd say, no, your neighbors are annoyed. But they still by right have the right to annoy them 20 times a year, right? We can't take away that right. No, no. So by the way I understand it, if they have a license to sell beer or wine, then if there are a lot of complaints, the license commission can step in and say, let's have a conversation about this after six events, not until they get to 19 or 20. The license commission does that with bars downtown. They'll do it with other events. So they can be the monitoring board there to, to, to put a little kind of caution and supervision on the events. My question is, does this rely on that farm stand, that farmer um, making wine or craft beer on his or her premises? Yes. Yes. They have That's what I believe the farm, the farmer brewer's license is. Yes. So write that in there. It's going to really limit the number of people who are going to do any kind of events. First of all, they have to start an operation like the farm at Mineral Hills or Red Barn, whatever they're called. They have mm -hmm. a winery. Someone else is going to start a beer, a craft beer place or another winery. Um, it's really ancillary to that production, that agricultural use. It's just not, I have a farm stand and I sell potatoes and carrots, and on this weekend I'm going to host a wedding and bring in bartenders and that kind of thing. But I, I don't see that clearly in this, but that's my understanding. Well, because you could also do the other thing. I mean, like, you could go to the License Commission and say, I want to hold events on my farm, and I'm going to serve alcohol, so they might get a one-day permit. That's why I took out the term annual in the per, in the language because the license commission does give one-off permits or five, you know, five at a time versus an annual that says you can do it seven days a week, you know, twelve hours during the day. So there is that other thing, um, and that's the piece that gets that is problematic because the license commission is operating off in their own world about granting licenses for liquor and beer and wine. But that then there's a zoning piece. So the problem is that in the, on this ordinance, it's saying you actually, it has to be coming from your property to be able to get this license from the license commission because the license commission can do whatever it does to grant a license to whomever. Um, but under zoning, what we're really trying to say is it's you're in a rural area where you're growing things. You usually don't have five acres of potatoes downtown, right? So clearly this is not a place where bars typically pop up. But if the license commission is then granting licenses for bars all over the place, that become that's why it's so important to make sure it's tied to the land in some way. Um, 
So that's what this would do as well. Great. George, you said, so does the licensing commission have a six complaint threshold or is that just an example you were using? Just an example, as it would oh, be okay. with any of the bars downtown, if the police respond to a bar three weekends in a row, the license commission steps in and tells the permittee to come before them and talk about it. Um, so the same thing would happen with these events. If it really got out of hand after two, two events saying it was the license commission would step in. If they were selling beer and alcohol, if it's just a mayoral license, then I guess the mayor and her assistant steps in, but without beer and alcohol, usually events don't get too out of hand. Right, and that's the difference between licensing, which can be revoked at any time, versus zoning, which zoning sort of builds in, this is an allowed use. And so if you're at a certain threshold and you're not exceeding that, you can continue to do that no matter how many times the neighbors raise their concerns. This came up um, in Cummington where we rented a house when I got married um, at, uh, it was a dance, you know, Jacob's Pillow Light kind of house full of dancers. And they were not drinking or doing anything, uh, maybe other illicit things I don't know about, but uh, there was no alcohol being served, but they were having like these dance parties and stuff that were getting, and the neighbor, and it became a big like town issue. Um, I don't know how it got resolved. It probably was an issue because there was no zoning or nothing addressing it, I suppose. Um, but there was no license um, fallback, I guess, uh, remedy. So, yeah. it's, so it sounds like we're, I mean, so the arbitrary number works because it doesn't really, I mean, first of all, it's enough for any summer person doing stuff during their, their summers, no matter what. And as, as David said earlier, no one's, no one's throwing these events in February. Well, like, I did, you know, I would argue that somebody with a farm could uh, have some kind of cross country ski. They did, could do some creative winter festivals that would be tied into, you know, beer and wine also. Um, fall things in the fall, you can do apple picking. Uh, you know, Outlook Farm has a really booming business around events, pig roasts and hay, hay rides, things like that. Um, I, we just aren't seeing it in Northampton yet. Chris? My, my reading of this is there are two, two possibilities. One is related to alcohol produced on site, but two is just related to any event that you charge money for that requires a mayoral license. So just to clarify, because I feel George, like you're saying that there has to be alcohol involved for this to apply. And I, I, that's not how I'm reading it. But if I might, I think the mayoral event, the mayoral event, mayoral license only applies to those that don't have alcohol or as I understand it, if it has alcohol, it has to go through the license board. So right, any farm can hold an event with a mayoral license. They can, regardless of what they grow on their farm. Melissa. Yes. Um, so everything. I mean, every. I see. I see every side of this. It. It. It seems to me like. Um, you know, as as these zoning code uh, items are complaint driven, strictly complaint driven. That's why they're there. It. It seems like this is more uh, just a mechanism to give us some teeth in case there's a complaint. Um, and I get that the number's arbitrary, um, but it, it feels to me like it's, it's less about the number than it is about if there are complaints, then there's some teeth somewhere in a, in a code that says, you gotta come before us. And what is that number? 
but at, at that point, <clears throat> we then have the ability to look at it and see what you know what what is causing the problem and is this something that is within our jurisdiction to address, like parking or water runoff or whatever the case may be. I mean, you you could make the number two. You you could make it that we have to see all of them right from the get go, but that would prohibit. I, I think what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's the way I'm viewing it is it's, it's really just an, an avenue for us to, for somebody to be able to call the commissioner and the commissioner to be able to say, okay, you're over 20, you know, you need to go talk to the, you know, you need to go talk to the folks like us. I don't know. That's just the way I'm seeing, I'm hearing it. I, can I just add to that? I think that's um, that I would say that's what um, I think the impetus is, is and sort of to relate to the numbers, like if it's 20 versus 60, you know, if you have 60 event, again, sort of issues of parking may be the same if you have 20 or 60, except it might not be if, for example, you have a gravel pad or a mud pit where people are parking and the more events you have with a hundred people each, the more it gets torn up, the more erosion it causes, the more offsite impacts there are. And so that's another piece to, whereas if you're small, if you only have a few, you know, the ground might be able to recover between events or it won't be so disturbed. I mean, so there's other things like that that could, that you know, um, would make sense to have somebody review, which definitely the license commission is not reviewing. I would suggest uh, just for a minute, we have a couple of people in the audience and it is a public hearing, which has been a great discussion, but maybe we uh, um, allow, see if John Hansel or Alex Garrett would like to make any comments. Uh, no, thanks. No, no comments. This will be a legislative matters on Monday. So I'm just wanting to get a head start. Good to see you, Alex. Bring all these controversies to the legislative matters committee. Mr. Hansel. I personally missed a lot of it. I was on the phone with somebody, but it just seems a, a lot of going back and forth on something that shouldn't be so challenging. That's the nature of our volunteer board. Thank you for doing this. Okay. Um, okay, other clarifying comments from the planning board? Chris? I think if this is a mechanism for enforcement that, you know, it won't come up unless there's complaints, we should have the, a lower number. So when there are complaints, we can act on it. You know, I feel like if neighbors are having problems, um, 20 events is gonna be a lot of events every year for them to have problems with. So we should be lower. If I'm thinking about Carolyn's example of maybe of tearing up the field with people parking in it, maybe we would wanna think about maybe once a week, um, you know, in the summer. So, so what is that, 10 events? Or maybe you say you just have one event per week instead of saying you have 52 events. You know what I mean? Like, if, again, I, I feel like frequency is, is more of an issue because you could have 10 events and have them back to back to back to back to back to back to back, which would be a lot different than having one event a week. I kind of agree, but I, I also think you're planning on kind of the worst case scenario, um, which we have to do, I know. But again, I think people are going to approach this, the farmers, and they're going to approach this very, you know, very slowly. Um, they're not going to stick a lot of money into events with beer and alcohol if they're not producing any on their own property. Um, but I'm, I'm flexible. If you want to say 10, I wouldn't go above 20. Um, but if you want to say 10, sure. Again, but George, I still don't understand why it's about alcohol on their own property, because this, uh, this again is about two different things. It's not just selling alcohol produced on the property, but it's other events 
that you charge right. money for. Right. Like I don't like ice skating in the winter or something. I you know I don't know. You could think of a lot of different things to do on a big piece of property. But I don't think those are the kind of events that will cause problems. To be quite honest, I think the events that have uh, alcohol are going to be much more attractive and draw more numbers than a skating event or a hayride. Um, that's just the nature of our the, the human, our human kind, you know. That's where the problems come with noise and parking problems and people urinating it in my backyard and things like that. It doesn't happen from families going on an ice skating or a toboggan run. So I think it really does. But those things are still people. illegal. Oh, I mean, you can't urinate on people on property that can be dealt with lots of other ways. Um, and, you know, as for this town, I, I think that there's a value in having it higher for the for the reason that, it, you know, if this town is about, uh, you know, entertainment and, and, and people coming and people joining, enjoying their spaces, I think capping those things at a low at a lower number is uh, doesn't help people make more make, make more money. We, um, can I just ask for clarification? Chris, were you suggesting a number of 10 or 12 before site plan? So anything under 10 to 12 is by right, and then above that would be site plan? So, so Carolyn, I, in that situation, the site after site plan, they could have more if it was deemed okay. Right, and it, unless you want to put an upper cap on it, or maybe you don't need an upper cap because site plan can dictate what that upper cap is. I think that that's, I think that as long as that is very clear that what this is, is, you know, you have, you have the, uh, this temporary, this temporary number that you can do by right. Um, and then afterwards you have a site plan that makes a lot of sense. So through the, through the site plan process, the board has the jurisdiction to impose a cap. Yeah, or or limitations of some sort. Okay. Oh, yeah. So besides certainly an invite. What was that, Sam? Nothing. So besides the number. 10, 15, 20, that prompts the special permit. Is there other language things in here that anybody? I think people should only be able, able to have parties if they're really cool parties, you know? Amen. <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think we're allowed to say that. Or if they're really cool people, we should really dictate that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Perhaps a little straw vote before we make a, uh, somebody makes a motion. And again, our motion is just to recommend the zoning ordinance, the, the, the amendment on to the city council. And as Councilor Jared said, they'll take it up in legislative matters. They'll have a public hearing, then city councilors will have a public hearing. So a lot of people get a chance to bite at this. Um, so a straw vote, people okay with 20 at this point before it bumps into the special permit, or would you rather lower it on Chris's recommendation? Um, I, I like the lowering number. Again, Sam, you like what? I, I think a, a, a number that's that's lower uh, makes makes sense. Or, and maybe if I can add, if someone has, um, you know, what might be, I don't know if this, this could happen, but if someone someone came and said, we have these 25 events, you know, let's just, let's say that we said our number was uh, 12. It, you know, so, <clears throat> someone said, you know, we have this thing we want to do uh, an event every, every week. Um, you know, is there some way of, of them coming before us or wherever they need to go before, uh, they before the that 12 number is crossed. Oh, 
they would have to do the whole special permit application if they were applying. I, it's my understanding if they were applying for 25 or 35, you know, so many above the, the 12 number limit, they'd have to go through the whole special permit process. Okay. But whatever the number is, you know, they could, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, Sam, but if they would, or if they're thinking about doing 25, they can get up to yeah. 12, they could do 12 and go no further until they get permission from the, you know, whatever that number is from the planning board and then go exceed that. But it doesn't stop them just because they don't have their permit for 25, they could still get up to 12. If that's what you're asking. No, no, I, I I understand that. What I'm saying is like my what I'm imagining is someone. It's during the summer. Someone has had uh, eight great wedding events in, on their property, and they have a bunch of people in New York who want to to have uh, you know another another ten over the summer, and they're going to bring in lots of money. Um, but there's not another meeting for another month because meetings don't happen a whole lot during the summer. Is there a way to, at eight, to say, you know, we haven't crossed 12, but we, we have another six that people, you know, want to want to come and we, we have people coming and want to spend money. Um, can we get these things okayed? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Get the plan sense. ahead. <laughs> well, that's what I'm, but, but, this, but in my situation, what I'm saying is this person is planning ahead. They're actually saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, uh, I don't think they have to have those later ones actually planned. You can get the permit in advance. You can get a permit for 25 or 50 or whatever, even if you've only had the five. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm asking. So that this does not stop you from having to stop at at whatever our cutoff number is no. well but you if if you the timing isn't right if you didn't plan far enough ahead and you're at five and you're like oops i really want to do 25 if you you can apply right then and you get okay to, that's what i'm you, saying you get a, yeah that's what i'm asking i'm saying you can apply before you hit your before you've actually okay. had the 12 events okay yeah. You can apply three years ahead of time because you have three years to exercise a permit. <laughs> oh, Jesus, party. <laughs> is this by calendar year? Is this how that would work? Like in 2024, I'm doing this many events? No, it's actually from the date of your permit. So it's three okay. years starting the date that, that your permit's issued. You no, I mean to. like, no, but like the number oh, of events Oh, per the year. number, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, yes, yeah calendar let's pause for a minute and move over to uh council chair Scott Andres. Uh, thank you so i i heard some mention of special permit and i just wanted to be clear there, there this isn't a special permit category this is a site plan category right right okay thank you I, actually carolyn i would suggest you change it to a year starting from whenever you're issuing the well, I don't know. This is if you apply for a permit in August. How does that work? You could do a lot of events in the last five months of the year. I guess that's fine, right? Not a permit. Um, I shouldn't say, yeah. sorry, I shouldn't have said permit. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think everything is based on calendar year. I would hate to introduce something. Okay. Fine. What number do we want to recommend? We can move on. I like 12. 12 is a good year. I'd like 20 myself to have a higher limit, but I'll go with 12. Great. Not up to us anyway. Let the city council decide on the number. You can make a recommendation, which will be your vote to that. So again, I just want to clarify one thing. Somebody, I forget whether it's Chris or Sam, said these people have six weddings. They go really well. They want to have eight more. Now these weddings have alcohol. Some of that alcohol has to be produced on site by this farmer. Yes. Wow. 
Yes. No. Yes. 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 They could bring in other so alcohol, can... but they've got to prove that right. some of their hard cider or their craft beer or their wine is produced on site. Just like all the farm stands around the city, right? they, may, they, right. Have, so, to, yeah. they have to show that their produce comes, at least a portion of it comes from their land there in Northampton. For either right. category, either frequency, right? Right. That right. Doesn't, okay. right. Like events with no outside alcohol don't get counted differently from well, no, this whole thing is about sort of value added from what you're producing. So anything that you're doing on site, I mean, like, and the farmer brewers licensing is about that, but it's also about, so you can have a certain percentage that's not produced on site, but it's primarily this, the, you know, if you're doing these events and you're So, you know, it's it's a little bit confusing because the license commission has this whole other jurisdiction from zoning and sort of what the agricultural exemptions are. Um, but this the alcoholic um, the accessory events don't necessarily have to be related to what's on site, but it's the service of alcohol beverages are about um, creating beverages based on the product that you're growing on the property. And that's the whole, that's the whole reason that we got into this is because Massachusetts changed its rules about, you know, hop growers and grape growers and apple cideries and all this stuff. So they have a special carve out and that's where this, these wires got crossed between zoning and licensing. And if, if you're not going to have a, a alcohol during your event, you just go and get a mayoral license. Just put in a Ferris wheel right. or a, a skating rink. Right. Right. Krista, you want to. So I heard 12. Did someone make a motion on that or no? Not yet. Okay. We have to close the public hearing yet. Yeah. Krista, did you want to say anything? Oh, I just had a quick question. How many, do you know, Carolyn, in, in the city of Northampton, how many farms would in theory, take advantage of this? We don't know? No. Okay. Okay. Go. Go. Hello, Chris. I'm sorry. So I was kind of thinking that these could be weddings that would serve alcohol, for example. So there, there could be no al alcohol involved in any of these events unless it was produced on site. So a portion of it in accordance to the regs have to be produced on site. So again, that's okay. going to limit the people who get into this for sure. And your so, strawberry, if you make, if you grow strawberries and you give them to make strawberry beer uh, from a local beer maker, like provisions, could, could you then serve that beer at your at your farm? I, I would think so. Yeah. It's not being done. The, the beer making is not being done there. It's being done at provisions. So um, you know what? I'm going to answer this question by saying it's going to be up to the building commission to interpret what the um, whether or not Amen. there's a relationship there. <laughs> Yeah, oh I, I just when I when I read the reg, it just sounds like, you know, there's this number one is one thing, alcohol produced on site, hundred percent, yes, understand it. Number two is any event unrelated to on site production, which to me could still be a wedding that serves alcohol that isn't produced on site. Wedding and weddings and alcohol are different, <laughs> so you know, um, you. Can so no, I mean, the, the, the answer is you can have other events and um, typically I get they're tied, I think probably all the time they're tied together, but um, it may not be right for a certain farm to have weddings if they aren't also producing cider or wine or um, beer from the, from the crops that they're growing. 
And I'm sorry, I know this is completely unrelated, but if you own a property and you want to have a wedding in your backyard with that's catered with alcohol, what's the mechanism that says, no, you can't do that? You can do that. Okay. Are you chart because it's your wedding and you're inviting your guests. That's your party. You're not charging people to come to your, well, I, I won't go there. But typically, you you know, it's different if it's your own personal thing. You can do that wherever you want. And you don't need a license. Okay. So you could so go to your friend's farm and have a wedding as long as your friend isn't charging you to have the wedding there. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let's take sort of alcohol out of it. If I have a chicken farm and I'm serving fried chicken at my party, can I, my party have alcohol? Sure. How much time I do mean, you have? I like fried chicken. That's a great party to me. So it, it's all dependent upon whether it's you for you Listen, or you're the making. The building inspector is going to say it. Whatever. Yeah. You know, we have if we have a cool building inspector, the answer is yes. Not cool. Answer is no. Again, we're we're trying to loosen up some of the opportunities for farmers out there to do things and they will be creative and there'll probably be puzzles like this. And no doubt some neighbors are gonna piss and moan because we had some unforeseen consequence, but right, the building inspector can sort through that because 90% of the, the agricultural people will be doing the right thing in, in my humble opinion. Is there a motion to close public hearing? I make a motion to close public hearing. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. We'll go to a roll call. Um, we'll start with David. Uh, yes. And Chris? Yes. Sam? Yes. And Krista? Yes. Melissa? Yes. George and yes, and it's unanimous. All right, public hearing closed. Um, so again, we're we're making a motion to recommend uh, the ordinance changes. I think with this one of, of one change from twenty to twelve. Are there other changes that we're suggesting? Are we removing the cap of sixty? I think we could remove the cap because if it comes to the site plan review process, we would, you know, the facilities would be there to comfortably have unlimited events. Okay. I agree with that. Is there uh, someone who would like to venture into that scary world of motion making? I move that we recommend the changes to the zoning to the ordinance before us um, with the change to 12 events to uh, trigger site plan review and remove the cap of 60 events. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All right. So we'll go to that votes vote again. Uh, David, we'll start with you. Yes. And Chris? Yes. And Krista? Yes. And uh, Sam? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Great. And George, yes also. Unanimous. Good luck, Councillor Jared at Legislative Matters. I hope we did all the hard work for you. Thank you. City council meetings usually are pretty quick, so I don't think they'll have a problem. <laughs> All right. Carolyn, we have a few other things. Yes. Um, so we have minutes, we have an AR, and then also wanted to discuss future meetings and their location. 
So you can do, you want to do A&R first or minutes? Sure, A&R. Okay. So um, where did my screen, oops, hold on just a second. This is an A&R on Chesterfield Road. Um, it might be familiar to some of you. Melissa will have to recuse herself. Um, hold on, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get the right button here. Share. Okay, so I'll, I'll zoom in. Um, this is URA. I'm sorry, can you see that uh, plan? Do I need to zoom in further? Um, existing house. And then a new lot, the new lot would be uh, 0.4 acres, which is much bigger than the minimum lot size in urban residential A, uh, 75 feet of frontage and, and um, leave, which, and 50 feet is the minimum in URA. Um, so um, there's, um, it exceeds the minimum lot and frontage requirements. And this would be approved or not required. So you'd be voting to um, allow endorsement of this plan as not a subdivision plan. I move to endorse this ANR on Chesterfield Road. I second it. All right, moved by Chris, second by Krista. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All right. And Melissa, just kind of for my own curiosity, why are you recusing yourself? Oh, that's my piece of property. Okay, thank yep. you. Give a pretty good reason. Pretty good reason. Okay, <laughs> A&R motion has been made and seconded, and we'll go to a voice vote. Uh, Chris? Yes. David? Yes. And uh, Sam? Yes. And Krista? Are you with us? Yes. Okay, thank you. And George, yes, unanimous. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. Want to buy it? <laughs> it's on the market. Don't, don't get us involved. I don't want to make any financial gain for this decision. All right. Uh, so how about the minutes? Did everybody get a chance to look at the minutes of uh, January 13th, about four weeks ago. We had talked about, uh, there was a, a whole bunch of housekeeping ordinance changes. And then we talked about different committee assignments and who was going where. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes of January 18th, uh, 13th. 13th. Thank you. A second. Second. Thank you, David. Any discussion? All right. So voice, voice, vote. Krista. You approve yes. the minutes? Thank yep, you. Yep. And Chris? Yes. David? Yep. And Melissa? Yes. Sam? Yes. And George? Yes. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so in terms of meetings, we're, uh, as I mentioned, we're not going to meet February 24th. The next meeting would be March 10th. You have a couple of items, um, I believe, that will be coming forward for March 10th. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the form-based code may be introduced to council Mar at the March 3rd meeting. Um, so long as we can get final review and, and edits um, from Alan Seawald, the city solicitor, in time to introduce to city council on March 3rd. If it gets introduced to city council on March 3rd, that means it's gonna be referred out to both planning board and legislative matters. Um, I had a conversation with, or an email exchange with Councilor Jarrett about the possibility of doing joint public hearing um, and um, 
So if we can do a joint public hearing at the legislative matters meeting on March 14th, um, that would be great. Or alternatively, if that doesn't work, if we can't get enough members of the planning board on the 14th, um, we could potentially do it at the March 24th planning board meeting. Um, so I guess first I wanted to ask if you all could, if how many of you all might be available that Monday, March 14th? Is there a time at five or seven? Their time is typically at five, but if it's more, if we can get more planning board members a slightly later, we've done that before and they've been flexible about sort of starting doing their other business first or just starting their meeting a little bit later. Um, so can you say the day again? I'm sorry, I was opening my calendar. Monday the 14th. And I'm just gonna double check. Um, City Council. So we're, will there be alcohol at this meeting? <laughs> I, I, um, if it's, a, if it's on Zoom, I yeah. think so. BYOB. Um, the hops out your backyard, BYOB is the uh, cause and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> <laughs> So they start at 5.30 typically. Um, so I don't know if that time works for you or if it only works on the 14th for the majority of you, if it's a little bit later. Great. Okay. Is, that, is that okay with you, Krista? Sorry, God. Uh, no, I just chatted with, I just sent Carolyn the thing. The week of the 14th, I'm not available at all. That whole week. That whole week. Okay. Um, all right, there it is in the chat. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so Krista would be out. So um, the, the reason I'm just, if the rest of you could just hold that, just pencil it in, um, that would be great. I'm not sure if we're going to be ready because if it's not quite ready for review, I don't want to submit it to city council and then make a bunch of changes later. So the next possible would be it gets introduced to city council March 17th, in which case then um, legislative matters could come to planning board on the 24th and we could do it then. So um, it's good to have some flexibility. And, and the reason why we kind of we want to start the public hearing process in March is because April gets a little wonky again with vacation weeks and um, scheduling. Um, and so in order to sort of keep this going and the momentum going, we wanted to start it in March. Um, so that's that piece. And then the other one is just, uh, I wanted to take a poll with you all to see what your thoughts were about going back to in-person meetings. Um, you know, um, there's been a lot of discussion around the country about masks and um, in, in various places. And so things are seem to be trending in the right direction. Um, I don't know what you think about setting a date for going back to in-person or and when that would be. I'm certainly comfortable going back in person. Uh, given this would be at the city council chambers mm -hmm. we met eons ago. Um, and it would be kind of a hybrid meeting. You would also work out something for Zoom participants or it would be in person only. My recommendation would be that we can run a Zoom window, but not take public comment from the Zoom. Mm -hmm. can, can I just ask a question? I mean, are we like, I have no problem going back to in person, but in the because most of the time there was, I mean, it's a long time ago at this point, most of the time there was a small number of people anyways, but some of these events got packed. And I'm not sure that that is a healthy thing to do in that tiny little room. I mean, we could also have, um, it's a good question. The window's open on both sides. There's an air purifier in there now. 
Um, we could also have a capacity for a while, you know, um, every other chair or something like that, or groups, you know, people separated. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. I mean, there probably is a capacity for the room, no matter what, but, you know, I mean, I'm... well, that I mean, a, a COVID capacity as yeah. opposed to a regular capacity. Isn't that up to someone? Isn't that Board of Health or somebody, the health department deciding those kinds of things or the building yeah. inspector? Yeah, I mean, there is, um, well, all the measure, you know, all the capacity limits have been lifted. Um, essentially, but I can certainly check in to see whether, you know, what, what kinds of things might be in place. And I don't know if we'd have, uh, you know, there hasn't been any discussions internally, whether there'd be a vaccine proof, a vaccine requirement for coming to public meetings. Um, so that's probably something else that I could inquire about. Uh I would be in favor of going back and I don't think it's the expertise of this board to make the decisions on the guidelines in terms of those other things. I think someone else should be deciding that. But if they're- Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that you suggest okay. that. I was just trying to figure out whether that's gonna be something coming from elsewhere. Yeah. I'm in favor of going back in in-person as well. Okay. I'm, I'm neutral. I go either way. I don't. I don't have a firm grip on my schedule, but um, I'll make it work. Okay. I, I I don't have a problem with it. I do have a problem with with the uh, you know when when the numbers get when the numbers get up that high. Um, no, I mean I can you know I can double mask and I'm there. I'm. Gonna, supposed to be taking some special medication tomorrow that's gonna make make me be able to go out into these public places. But um, you know, I think there are a lot of people who won't be able to get these this medication, and I feel like not allowing them to come into. I guess I, I would say if we have a vaccine mandate, well, then I guess you could say. Uh, Zoom, Zoom is a non, a non -partic participant uh, situation. But if we don't have a vaccine mandate, then I don't think it's fair to uh, limit Zoom. For comment, um, you mean? For co for comment, that's right. I mean, if you are, if you are limiting, if you because that's just not, you know, speaking for the immunocompromised out there, uh, you know, the world has to move on and I per perfectly appreciate that. But if someone, if we're going, I mean, and so if there is limitations on the people, type of people who can come, well then great. But if you're just gonna let in anyone, well then some people might not be able to show up for their own health and, and I'd, and not having those people be able to participate is grossly unfair. Um, I can, so uh, why don't I do this? I will see sort of what the health department is and the mayor is saying about what kind of protocols would be put in place for these things as we move into public, meeting, public meetings. Um, and then bring that back to the next meeting for you guys to sort of chew on and figure out, you know, what makes sense. I'll also say that just um, people have always and will continue to be able to have the ability to send um, um, comments in, in any form, mail, email, um, at any time up until the hearing. So it's it. Um, we are never restricting people from providing their comment. It's just the avenue in which you know they would be able to do it um, if we just allowed viewing on Zoom versus just being able to um, view and comment um, from that forum. 
Yeah, and I would say I would say that that's exactly right in response to someone just being vaccinated. They can they can one hundred percent participate in their unvaccinated self from their e from an email versus coming into a public space and threatening my life. So, uh, I guess you're right. I just put it on the other side. Yeah. Well, so let me look at that and then we'll just, we'll bring it back at another meeting and see how, you know, what you guys are thinking at that point. Thanks Sam for bringing that up for us. Um, yeah. We could also wait to see what the city council does. And when they develop their protocols in their meeting in person, we could follow in their footsteps rather than do groundbreaking. Well, the Central Business Architecture Committee has already been meeting, so the city council can't be groundbreakers. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's there's opportunity to provide uh, comments in the chat too, right? During Zoom. So maybe we could just be a little more. No, but that's not really message you or is that only because I'm on the planning board? Um, so that I did tonight, but because um, Krista didn't have um, video, um, but we have not allowed chat because it's not visible necessarily for everybody. So it doesn't count as a public comment if, if not everybody has access to the chat box. Um, so someone would have to be monitoring it and then giving it to somebody else, it's a, it's a much more complicated thing. So we've never had chat available as a public comment um, uh, venue. Anything else, Carolyn? Um, no, that's it. So you, oh, so you, then again, sort of next meeting is March 10th. March 10th. Okay. And folks, if you still have time to send any comments about that zone-based code, that, that nice manual that we looked at in draft form with Carolyn, she'd appreciate it. I'm working on it. Oh. I'm working on some feedback, though. Uh, I, just, I had a, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, nope, I'm done. Uh, there was a PVPC meeting today, right before this. And one thing that came up, we were just having some sort of like report back from the towns. And there was, I, I just mentioned that we were doing this form-based code thing and it's in progress and, you know, stay tuned. Uh, but there were a lot of people from PVPC communities who were very interested. And at some point, uh, you know, someone said Wayne's name and a hush grew over the crowd. And it was very uh, dramatic uh, that he might uh, bless them with his presence and, and, and or, or maybe someone from um, um, that's Flinker or just, it, it was suggested that maybe someone from the North Hampton community at some point could talk about our experience with form-based code and, is and issues of density and affordability and all that stuff. So put that on your list of tasks. <laughs> Thank you. No, no pressure, it's at some point, you know? Yeah, okay, that's that's totally fine. <laughs> they, oh, they also said, oh, I brought it up in, in um, not to give you a test, but more to say, is there anything that PDP said PVPC has in terms of resources to talk about statistics in terms of affordability and accessibility of housing in our region versus Boston area versus this country, you know, just because those issues have come up a bunch of times with regard to these issues. So if there's any user friendly way that those could be uh, pulled out uh, and places we could direct people, it might be really useful. And they work, they like that. So Good. thanks, David. Well, is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Good second. Job, second. Made and seconded. Uh, no, any discussion? All right. Motion to be made to adjourn at 8.35. Uh, Melissa? Yes. Chris? Yes. George? Yes. Sam? Yes. David? Yes. And Krista? Yes. All right. 